Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, dash February 20, 1895, was an American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman. After escaping from slavery in Maryland, he became a national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, gaining note for his oratory and incisive anti-slavery writings. In his time, he was described by abolitionists as a living counterexample to slaveholders' arguments that slaves lacked the intellectual capacity to function as independent American citizens. Northerners at the time found it hard to believe that such a great orator had once been a slave. Douglas wrote several autobiographies. He described his experiences as a slave in his 1845 autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, which became a bestseller, and was influential in promoting the cause of abolition, as was his second book, My Bondage and My Freedom, 1855. After the Civil War, Douglass remained an active campaigner against slavery and wrote his last autobiography, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. First published in 1881 and revised in 1892, Three years before his death, it covered events during and after the Civil War. Douglas also actively supported women's suffrage and held several public offices. Without his approval, Douglas became the first African American nominated for vice president of the United States as the running mate and vice presidential nominee of Victoria Woodhull on the Equal Rights Party ticket. Douglas was a firm believer in the equality of all peoples, whether black, female, Native American, or recent immigrant. He was also a believer in dialogue and in making alliances across racial and ideological divides, and in the liberal values of the U.S. Constitution. When radical abolitionists, under the motto No Union with Slaveholders, criticized Douglas' willingness to dialogue with slave owners, he famously replied, I would unite with anybody to do right and with nobody to do wrong. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was born into slavery on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay in Talbot County, Maryland. The plantation was between Hillsborough and Cordova. His birthplace was likely his grandmother's cabin east of Tapper's Corner, and west of Tuckahoe Creek. The exact date of his birth is unknown, and he later chose to celebrate his birthday on February 14. In his first autobiography, Douglas stated, I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. Douglas was of mixed race, which likely included Native American and African on his mother's side, as well as European. His father was almost certainly white, as shown by historian David W. Blight in his 2018 biography of Douglas. He said his mother Harriet Bailey gave him his grand name. After escaping to the North years later, he took the surname Douglas, having already dropped his two middle names. He later wrote of his earliest times with his mother. The opinion was, whispered that my master was my father, but of the correctness of this opinion I know nothing, my mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, it, was, common custom, in the part of Maryland from which I ran away, to part children from their mothers at a very early age, I do not recollect ever seeing my mother by the light of day, she would lie down with me, and get me to sleep, but long before I waked she was gone. After this early separation from his mother, young Frederick lived with his maternal grandmother, Betty Bailey. At the age of six, he was separated from his grandmother and moved to the White House plantation, where Aaron Anthony worked as overseer. Douglas's mother died when he was about ten. After Anthony died, Douglas was given to Lucretia Ald, wife of Thomas Ald, who sent him to serve Thomas' brother Hugh Ald in Baltimore. He felt himself lucky to be in the city, where he said slaves were almost freemen, compared to those on plantations. When Douglas was about twelve, Hugh Ald's wife Sophia started teaching him the alphabet. Douglas described her as a kind and tender-hearted woman, who treated him as she supposed one human being ought to treat another. Hugh Ald disapproved of the tutoring, feeling that literacy would encourage slaves to desire freedom. Douglas later referred to this as the first decidedly anti-slavery lecture he had ever heard. Under her husband's influence, Sophia came to believe that education and slavery were incompatible and one day snatched a newspaper away from Douglas. In his autobiography, Douglas related how he learned to read from white children in the neighborhood, and by observing the writings of the men with who worked. Douglas continued, secretly, to teach himself how to read and write. He later often said, knowledge is the pathway from slavery to freedom. As Douglas began to read newspapers, pamphlets, political materials, and books of every description, this new realm of thought led him to question and condemn the institution of slavery. In later years, 
Douglas credited the Columbian Orator, an anthology that he discovered at about age 12, with clarifying and defining his views on freedom and human rights. The book, first published in 1797, is a classroom reader, containing essays, speeches and dialogues, to assist students in learning reading and grammar. When Douglas was hired out to William Freeland, he taught other slaves on the plantation to read the New Testament at a weekly Sunday school. As word spread, the interest among slaves in learning to read was so great that in any week, more than 40 slaves would attend lessons. For about six months, their study went relatively unnoticed. While Freeland remained complacent about their activities, other plantation owners became incensed about their slaves being educated. One Sunday they burst in on the gathering, armed with clubs and stones, to disperse the congregation permanently. In 1833, Thomas All took Douglas back from Hugh, a as a means of punishing Hugh, Douglas later wrote. Thomas Ald sent Douglas to work for Edward Covey, a poor farmer who had a reputation as a slave breaker. He whipped Douglas regularly, and nearly broke him psychologically. The 16 year old Douglas finally rebelled against the beatings, however, and fought back. After Douglas won a physical confrontation, Covey never tried to beat him again. Douglas first tried to escape from Freeland, who had hired him out from his owner Colonel Lloyd, but was unsuccessful. In 1836, he tried to escape from his new master Covey, but failed again. In 1837, Douglas met and fell in love with Anna Murray, a free black woman in Baltimore about five years older than he. Her free status strengthened his belief in the possibility of gaining his own freedom. Murray encouraged him and supported his efforts by aid and money. On September 3, 1838, Douglas successfully escaped by boarding a train from the newly merged Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad, P.W.N.B., railroad line to the great northern cities. The area where he boarded was a short distance east of the previous temporary P.W.N.B. train depot in a recently developed neighborhood between the modern neighborhoods of Harbor East and Little Italy. The depot was located at President and Fleet Streets, east of the basin of the Baltimore Harbor on the northwest branch of the Patapsco River. This depot was replaced by the historic President Street Station, constructed 1849 to 1850. It was noted as a site of other slave escapes along one of many routes off the famous Underground Railroad and during the Civil War. Young Douglas reached Hever de Grace, Maryland, in Harford County, in the northeast corner of the state, along the southwest shore of the Susquehanna River, which flowed into the Chesapeake Bay. Although this placed him some 20 miles from the free state of Pennsylvania, it was easier to travel through Delaware, another slave state. Dressed in a sailor's uniform provided to him by Murray, who also gave him part of her savings to cover his travel costs, he carried identification papers and protection papers that he had obtained from a free black seaman. Douglas crossed the wide Susquehanna River by their railroad steam ferry at Haver de Grace to Perryville on the opposite shore in Cecil County then continued by train across the state line to Wilmington, Delaware, a large port at the head of the Delaware Bay. From there, because the rail line was not yet completed, he went by steamboat along the Delaware River further northeast to the Quaker city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, an anti-slavery stronghold. He continued to the safe house of noted abolitionist David Ruggles in New York City. His entire journey to freedom took less than 24 hours. Frederick Douglass later wrote of his arrival in New York City. Once Douglas had arrived, he sent for Murray to follow him north to New York. She brought with her the necessary basics for them to set up a home. They were married on September 15, 1838, by a black Presbyterian minister, just eleven days after Douglas had reached New York. At first, they adopted Johnson as their married name, to divert attention. The couple settled in New Bedford, Massachusetts, in 1838, later moving to Lynn, Massachusetts in 1841. After meeting and staying with Nathan and Mary Johnson, they adopted Douglas as their married name. Douglas had grown up using his mother's surname of Bailey. After escaping slavery, he had changed his surname first to Stanley and then to Johnson. In New Bedford, the latter was such a common name that he wanted one that was more distinctive, and asked Nathan Johnson to choose a suitable surname. Nathan Johnson had been reading the poem The Lady of the Lake, and suggested Douglas. Two of the principal characters in Walter Scott's poem have the surname Douglas. Douglas thought of joining a white Methodist church but from the beginning, he was disappointed when he saw it was segregated. Later he joined the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, an independent black denomination first established in New York City, which counted among its members Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. He became a licensed preacher in 1839.
and this helped him hone his oratorical skills. He held various positions, including steward, Sunday school superintendent, and sexton. In 1840, Douglas delivered a speech in Elmira, New York, then a station on the Underground Railroad. Years later, a black congregation formed there and by 1940 it became the region's largest church. Douglas also joined several organizations in New Bedford, and regularly attended abolitionist meetings. He subscribed to William Lloyd Garrison's weekly journal The Liberator. Inspired by Garrison, Douglas later said, No face and form ever impressed me with such sentiments, of the hatred of slavery, as did those of William Lloyd Garrison. So deep was this influence that in his last biography, Douglas confessed his paper took a place in my heart second only to the Bible. Garrison was likewise impressed with Douglas, and had written about his anti-colonialism stance in The Liberator as early as 1839. In 1841, Douglas first heard Garrison speak at a meeting of the Bristol Anti-Slavery Society. At another meeting, Douglas was unexpectedly invited to speak. After telling his story, Douglas was encouraged to become an anti-slavery lecturer. A few days later Douglas spoke at the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society's annual convention in Nantucket. Then 23 years old, Douglas conquered his nervousness and gave an eloquent speech about his rough life as a slave. While living in Lynn, Douglas engaged in early protest against the segregation in transportation. In September 1841 at Lynn Central Square Station, Douglas and friend James N. Buffum were thrown off an eastern railroad train because Douglas refused to sit in the segregated railroad coach. In 1843, Douglas joined other speakers in the American Anti-Slavery Society's Hundred Conventions Project, a six-month tour at meeting halls throughout the eastern and midwestern United States. During this tour, slavery supporters frequently accosted Douglas. At a lecture in Pendleton, Indiana, an angry mob chased and beat Douglas before a local Quaker family, the Hardys, rescued him. His hand was broken in the attack, it healed improperly and bothered him for the rest of his life. A stone marker in Falls Park in the Pendleton Historic District commemorates this event. Douglass's best-known work is his first autobiography narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, written during his time in Lynn, Massachusetts and published in 1845. At the time, some skeptics questioned whether a black man could have produced such an eloquent piece of literature. The book received generally positive reviews and became an immediate bestseller. Within three years, it had been reprinted nine times, with 11,000 copies circulating in the United States. It was also translated into French and Dutch and published in Europe. Douglas published three versions of his autobiography during his lifetime, and revised the third of these, each time expanding on the previous one. The 1845 narrative was his biggest seller, and probably allowed him to raise the funds to gain his legal freedom the following year, as discussed below. In 1855, Douglas published My Bondage and My Freedom. In 1881, after the Civil War, Douglas published Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, which he revised in 1892. Douglas' friends and mentors feared that the publicity would draw the attention of his ex-owner, Hewald, who might try to get his property back. They encouraged Douglas to tour Ireland, as many former slaves had done. Douglas set sail on the Cambria for Liverpool on August 16, 1845. He traveled in Ireland as the Irish potato famine was beginning. The feeling of freedom from American racial discrimination amazed Douglas. Eleven days and a half gone and I have crossed 3,000 miles of the perilous deep. Instead of a democratic government, I am under a monarchical government. Instead of the bright, blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft, gray fog of the Emerald Isle, Ireland. I breathe, and lo! The chattel, slave, becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for one who will question my equal humanity, claim me as his slave, or offer me an insult. I employ a cab, I am seated beside white people, I reach the hotel, I enter the same door, I am shown into the same parlor, I dine at the same table, and no one is offended, I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to white people. When I go to church, I am met by no upturned nose and scornful lip to tell me, we don't allow niggers in here. He also met and befriended the Irish nationalist Daniel O'Connell who was to be a great inspiration. Douglas spent two years in Ireland and Great Britain, where he gave many lectures in churches and chapels. His draw was such that some facilities were crowded to suffocation. One example was his hugely popular London reception speech, which Douglas delivered in May 1846 at Alexander Fletcher's Finsbury Chapel. Douglas remarked that in England he was treated not as a colour, but as a man. 
1846, Douglas met with Thomas Clarkson, one of the last living British abolitionists, who had persuaded Parliament to abolish slavery in Great Britain's colonies. During this trip Douglas became legally free, as British supporters led by Anna Richardson and her sister-in-law Ellen of Newcastle-upon-Tyne raised funds to buy his freedom from his American owner Thomas Ald. Many supporters tried to encourage Douglas to remain in England but, with his wife still in Massachusetts and three million of his black brethren in bondage in the United States, he returned to America in the spring of 1847, soon after the death of Daniel O'Connell. In the 21st century, historical plaques were installed on buildings in Cork and Waterford, Ireland, and London to celebrate Douglas's visit. The first is on the Imperial Hotel in Cork and was unveiled on August 31, 2012. The second is on the facade of Waterford City Hall and was unveiled on October 7, 2013. It commemorates his speech there on October 9, 1845. The third plaque adorns Nell Gwen House, South Kensington in London, where Douglas stayed with the British abolitionist George Thompson. After returning to the U.S. in 1847, Douglas started publishing his first abolitionist newspaper, The North Star, from the basement of the Memorial M.E. Zion Church in Rochester, New York. The North Star's motto was Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. The Ame Church and North Star vigorously opposed the mostly white American Colonization Society and its proposal to send blacks back to Africa. Douglas and Douglas's later abolitionist newspapers were mainly funded by English supporters, who gave Douglas 500 pounds to use as he chose. Douglas also soon split with Garrison perhaps because the North Star competed with Garrison's National Anti-Slavery Standard and Marius Robinson's Anti-Slavery Bugle. Douglas also came to consider Garrison too radical. Earlier Douglas had agreed with Garrison's position that the Constitution was pro-slavery, because of its compromises related to apportionment of congressional seats, based on partial counting of slave populations with state totals, and protection of the international slave trade through 1807. Garrison had burned copies of the Constitution to express his opinion. But, Lysander Spooner published The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, 1846, which explored the United States Constitution as an anti slavery document. Douglas's change of opinion about the Constitution and his splitting from Garrison around 1847 became one of the abolitionist movement's most notable divisions. Douglas angered Garrison by saying that the Constitution could and should be used as an instrument in the fight against slavery. In September 1848, Douglas published an open letter addressed to his former master, Thomas Ald, berating him for his conduct, and inquiring after members of his family still held by Ald. In a graphic passage, Douglas asked Ald how he would feel if Douglas had come to take away his daughter Amanda as a slave, treating her the way he and members of his family had been treated by Ald. In 1848, Douglas was the only African American to attend the Seneca Falls Convention the first women's rights convention, in upstate New York. Elizabeth Cady Stanton asked the assembly to pass a resolution asking for women's suffrage. Many of those present opposed the idea, including influential Quakers James and Lucretia Mott. Douglas stood and spoke eloquently in favor, he said that he could not accept the right to vote as a black man if women could not also claim that right. He suggested that the world would be a better place if women were involved in the political sphere. After Douglas's powerful words, the attendees passed the resolution. Also in the wake of the Seneca Falls Convention, Douglas used an editorial spot in his paper, The North Star, to press the case for women's rights in this public venue. The article was twofold, it recalled the marked ability and dignity of the proceedings and briefly conveyed several arguments of the convention and feminist thought at the time. On the first count, Douglas acknowledged the decorum of the participants in the face of disagreement. The latter half discussed the primary document had emerged from the conference, a declaration of sentiments, and his own discussion of the infant feminist caused out strikingly, he expressed the belief that, a, discussion of the rights of animals would be regarded with far more complacency, than would be a discussion of the rights of women, and Douglas noted the link between abolitionism and feminism, the overlap between the communities. His opinion as the prominent editor of the paper likely carried weight and he stated the position of the North Star explicitly, W.E. hold woman to be justly entitled to all we claim for man. This letter, written a week after the convention, reaffirmed the first part of the paper's slogan, Right is of no sex. Later, 
After the Civil War when the 15th Amendment to give freedmen and free blacks the right to vote was being debated, Douglas split with the Stanton-led faction of the women's rights movement. Douglas supported the amendment, which would grant suffrage to black men. Stanton opposed the 15th Amendment because it limited expansion of suffrage to black men, she predicted its passage would delay for decades the cause for women's right to vote. Stanton argued that American women and black men should band together to fight for universal suffrage, and opposed any bill that split the issues. Douglas and Stanton both knew that there was not yet enough male support for women's right to vote, but that an amendment giving black men the vote could pass in the late 1860s. Stanton wanted to attach women's suffrage to that of black men so that her cause would be carried to success. Douglas thought such a strategy was too risky, that there was barely enough support for black men's suffrage. He feared that linking the cause of women's suffrage to that of black men would result in failure for both. Douglas argued that white women, already empowered by their social connections to fathers, husbands, and brothers, at least vicariously had the vote. African American women, he believed, would have the same degree of empowerment as white women once African American men had the vote. Douglas assured the American women that at no time had he ever argued against women's right to vote. Meanwhile, in 1851, Douglas merged the North Star with Garrett Smith's Liberty Party paper to form Frederick Douglass paper, which was published until 1860. On July 5, 1852, Douglas delivered an address to the ladies of the Rochester Anti-Slavery Sewing Society. This speech eventually became known as Watto the Slave is the 4th of July. One biographer called it perhaps the greatest anti-slavery oration ever given. In 1853, he was a prominent attendee of Radical Abolitionist National African American Convention in Rochester. His was one of five names attached to the address of the Convention to the People of the United States published under the title, The Claims of Our Common Cause, along with Amos Noah A. Freeman, James Monroe Whitfield, Henry O. Wagoner, and George Boyer Vachon. Like many abolitionists, Douglas believed that education would be crucial for African Americans to improve their lives. This led Douglas to become an early advocate for school desegregation. In the 1850s, Douglas observed that New York's facilities and instruction for African American children were vastly inferior to those for whites. Douglas called for court action to open all schools to all children. He said that full inclusion within the educational system was a more pressing need for African Americans than political issues such as suffrage. On March 12, 1859, Douglas met with radical abolitionists John Brown, George de Baptiste, and others at William Webb's house in Detroit to discuss emancipation. Douglas met Brown again, when Brown visited his home two months before leading the raid on the Federal Armory in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. However, Douglas disapproved of Brown's plan to start an armed slave rebellion in the South. Douglas believed that attacking federal property would enrage the American public. After the raid, Douglas fled for a time to Canada fearing guilt by association as well as arrest as a co-conspirator. Years later, Douglas shared a stage in Harper's Ferry with Andrew Hunter, the prosecutor who secured Brown's conviction and execution. In March 1860, while Douglas was once again traveling in England, his youngest daughter Annie died in Rochester, New York. Douglas sailed back from England the following month, traveling through Canada to avoid detection. Douglas considered photography very important in ending slavery and racism and believed that the camera would not lie, even in the hands of the racist white, as photographs were an excellent counter to the many racist caricatures, particularly in blackface minstrelsy. He was the most photographed American of the 19th century, self-consciously using photography to advance his political views. He never smiled, specifically so as not to play into the racist caricature of a happy slave. He tended to look directly into the camera to confront the viewer, with a stern look. As a child, Douglas was exposed to a number of religious sermons, and in his youth, he sometimes heard Sophia Ald reading the Bible. In time, he became interested in literacy, he began reading and copying Bible verses, and he eventually converted to Christianity. He described this approach in his last biography, Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. I was not more than thirteen years old, when in my loneliness and destitution I longed for someone to whom I could go as to a father and protector. The preaching of a white Methodist minister, named Hanson, was the means of causing me to feel that in God I had such a friend. He thought that all men, great and small, bond and free, were sinners in the sight of God, that they were by nature rebels against his government, and that they must repent of their sins, and be reconciled to God through Christ. I cannot say that I had a very distinct notion of what was required of me, but one thing I did know well, 
I was wretched and had no means of making myself otherwise. I consulted a good old colored man named Charles Lawson, and in tones of holy affection he told me to pray, and to cast all my care upon God. This I sought to do, and though for weeks I was a poor, broken hearted mourner, traveling through doubts and fears, I finally found my burden lightened, and my heart relieved. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted, though I abhorred slavery more than ever. I saw the world in a new light and my great concern was to have everybody converted. My desire to learn increased, and especially, did I want a thorough acquaintance with the contents of the Bible. Douglas was mentored by Rev. Charles Lawson, and, early in his activism, he often included biblical allusions and religious metaphors in his speeches. Although a believer, he strongly criticized religious hypocrisy and accused slaveholders of wickedness, lack of morality, and failure to follow the golden rule. In this sense, Douglas distinguished between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of America and considered religious slaveholders and clergymen who defended slavery as the most brutal, sinful, and cynical of all who represented wolves in sheep's clothing. Notably, in a famous oration given in the Corinthian Hall of Rochester, he sharply criticized the attitude of religious people who kept silent about slavery, and held that religious ministers committed a blasphemy when they taught it as sanctioned by religion. He considered that a law passed to support slavery was one of the grossest infringements of Christian liberty and said that pro-slavery clergymen within the American church strip the love of God of its beauty, and leave the throne of religion a huge, horrible, repulsive form, and an abomination in the sight of God. Of ministers like John Chase Lord, Leonard Elijah Lathrop, Ichabod Spencer, and Orville Dewey, he said that they taught, against the scriptures, that we ought to obey man's law before the law of God. He further asserted, in speaking of the American church, however, let it be distinctly understood that I mean the great mass of the religious organizations of our land. There are exceptions, and I thank God that there are. Noble men may be found, scattered all over these northern states Henry Ward Beecher of Brooklyn, Samuel J. May of Syracuse, and my esteemed friend Robert R. Raymond. He maintained that upon these men lies the duty to inspire our ranks with high religious faith and zeal and to cheer us on in the great mission of the slave's redemption from his chains. In addition, he called religious people to embrace abolitionism, stating, Let the religious press, the pulpit, the Sunday school, the conference meeting, the great ecclesiastical, missionary, Bible and tract associations of the land array their immense power say against slavery and slaveholding, and the whole system of crime and blood would be scattered to the wind. During his visits to the United Kingdom, between 1846 and 1848, Douglas asked British Christians never to support American churches that permitted slavery, and he expressed his happiness to know that a group of ministers in Belfast had refused to admit slaveholders as members of the church. On his return to the United States, Douglas founded the North Star, a weekly publication with the motto Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. Douglas later wrote a letter to his former slaveholder, in which he denounced him for leaving Douglas's family illiterate. Sometimes considered a precursor of a non-denominational liberation theology, Douglas was a deeply spiritual man, as his home continues to show. The fireplace mantle features busts of two of his favorite philosophers, David Friedrich Strauss, author of The Life of Jesus, and Ludwig Feuerbach, author of The Essence of Christianity. In addition to several Bibles and books about various religions in the library, images of angels and Jesus are displayed, as well as interior and exterior photographs of Washington's Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. Throughout his life, Douglas had linked that individual experience with social reform, and like other Christian abolitionists, he followed practices such as abstaining from tobacco, alcohol and other substances that he believed corrupted body and soul. By the time of the Civil War, Douglas was one of the most famous black men in the country, known for his orations on the condition of the black race and on other issues such as women's rights. His eloquence gathered crowds at every location. His reception by leaders in England and Ireland added to his stature. Douglas and the abolitionists argued that because the aim of the Civil War was to end slavery, African Americans should be allowed to engage in the fight for their freedom. Douglas publicized this view in his newspapers and several speeches. In August 1861, Douglas published an account of the first Battle of Bull Run that noted that there were some blacks already in the Confederate ranks. A few weeks later, Douglas brought the subject up again, quoting a witness to the battle who said they saw black Confederates with muskets on their shoulders and bullets in their pockets. <laughs>
Douglas conferred with President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 on the treatment of black soldiers, and with President Andrew Johnson on the subject of black suffrage. President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which took effect on January 1, 1863, declared the freedom of all slaves in Confederate-held territory. Slaves in Union-held areas and northern states were freed with the adoption of the 13th Amendment on December 6, 1865. Douglas describes the spirit of those awaiting the proclamation, We were waiting and listening as for a bolt from the sky, we were watching, by the dim light of the stars for the dawn of a new day, we were longing for the answer to the agonizing prayers of centuries. During the U.S. presidential election of 1864, Douglas supported John C. Fremont, who was the candidate of the abolitionist Radical Democracy Party. Douglas was disappointed that President Lincoln did not publicly endorse suffrage for black freedmen. Douglas believed that since African American men were a fighting for the Union in the American Civil War, they deserved the right to vote. With the North no longer obliged to return slaves to their owners in the South, Douglas fought for equality for his people. He made plans with Lincoln to move liberated slaves out of the South. During the war, Douglas also helped the Union cause by serving as a recruiter for the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. His eldest son, Charles Douglas, joined the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, but was ill for much of his service. Louis Douglas fought at the Battle of Fort Wagner. Another son, Frederick Douglas Jr., also served as a recruiter. The post war, 1865, ratification of the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment provided for citizenship and equal protection under the law. The 15th Amendment protected all citizens from being discriminated against in voting because of race. On April 14, 1876, Douglas delivered the keynote speech at the unveiling of the Emancipation Memorial in Washington's Lincoln Park. In that speech, Douglas spoke frankly about Lincoln, noting what he perceived as both positive and negative attributes of the late president. Calling Lincoln the white man's president, Douglas criticized Lincoln's tardiness in joining the cause of emancipation, noting that Lincoln initially opposed the expansion of slavery but did not support its elimination. But Douglas also asked, can any colored man, or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men, ever forget the night which followed the first day of January 1863, when the world was to see if Abraham Lincoln would prove to be as good as his word? Douglas also said, though Mr. Lincoln shared the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, it is hardly necessary to say that in his heart of hearts he loathed and hated slavery. The crowd, roused by his speech, gave Douglas a standing ovation. Lincoln's widow Mary Lincoln supposedly gave Lincoln's favorite walking stick to Douglas in appreciation. That walking stick still rests in Douglas's final residence, Cedar Hill, now preserved as the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. After the Civil War, Douglas continued to work for equality for African Americans and women. Due to his prominence and activism during the war, Douglas received several political appointments. He served as president of the Reconstruction Air Freedmen Savings Bank. Douglas also became charged affairs for the Dominican Republic, but resigned that position after two years because of disagreements with U.S. government policy. Meanwhile, white insurgents had quickly arisen in the South after the war, organizing first as secret vigilante groups, including the Ku Klux Klan. Armed insurgency took different forms. Powerful paramilitary groups included the White League and the Red Shirts both active during the 1870s in the Deep South. They operated as the military arm of the Democratic Party, turning out Republican officeholders and disrupting elections. Starting ten years after the end of the war, Democrats regained political power in every state of the former Confederacy and began to reassert white supremacy. They enforced this by a combination of violence, late 19th century laws imposing segregation and a concerted effort to disfranchise African Americans. New labor and criminal laws also limited their freedom. In an effort to combat these efforts, Douglas supported the presidential campaign of Ulysses S. Grant in 1868. In 1870, Douglas started his last newspaper, The New National Era, attempting to hold his country to its commitment to equality. President Grant sent a congressionally sponsored commission, accompanied by Douglas, on a mission to the West Indies to investigate if the annexation of Santo Domingo would be good for the United States. Grant believed annexation would help relieve the violent situation in the South, allowing African Americans their own state. Douglas and the commission favored annexation, however, Congress remained opposed to annexation. Douglas criticized Senator Charles Sumner, who opposed annexation stating if Sumner continued to oppose annexation he would regard him as the worst foe the colored race has on this continent. 
Act. After the midterm elections, Grant signed the Civil Rights Act of 1871, also known as the Klan Act, and the Second and Third Enforcement Acts. Grant used their provisions vigorously, suspending habeas corpus in South Carolina and sending troops there and into other states. Under his leadership, over 5,000 arrests were made. Grant's vigor in disrupting the Klan made him unpopular among many whites. But earned Douglas's praise. An associate of Douglas wrote of Grant that African Americans will ever cherish a grateful remembrance of his name, fame, and great services. In 1872, Douglas became the first African American nominated for vice president of the United States, as Victoria Woodhull's running mate on the Equal Rights Party ticket. He was nominated without his knowledge. Douglas neither campaigned for the ticket nor acknowledged that he had been nominated. In that year, he was presidential elector at large for the state of New York, and took that state's votes to Washington, D.C. However, in early June of that year, Douglas' home on South Avenue in Rochester, New York, burned down, arson was suspected. There was extensive damage to the house, its furnishings, and the grounds. In addition, 16 volumes of the North Star and Frederick Douglass paper were lost. Douglas then moved to Washington, D.C. Throughout the Reconstruction era, Douglas continued speaking, and emphasized the importance of work, voting rights and actual exercise of suffrage. Douglas's stump speech for 25 years after the end of the Civil War emphasized work to counter the racism that was then prevalent in unions. In a speech delivered on November 15, 1867, Douglas said, A man's rights rest in three boxes. The ballot box, jury box and the cartridge box. Let no man be kept from the ballot box because of his color. Let no woman be kept from the ballot box because of her sex. Douglas spoke at many colleges around the country. These included Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, in 1873. Douglas and Anna had five children, Rosetta Douglas, Louis Henry Douglas, Frederick Douglas Jr., Charles Raymond Douglas, and Annie Douglas, died at the age of 10. Charles and Rosetta helped produce his newspapers. Anna Douglas remained a loyal supporter of her husband's public work. His relationships with Julia Griffiths and Ottilie Assing, two women with whom he was professionally involved, caused recurring speculation and scandals. Assing was a young German woman who interviewed Douglas in 1856 and fell passionately in love with him. She introduced Douglas to her nation's poetry, philosophy, and wide range of culture. After Anna died in 1882, in 1884 Douglas married again, to Helen Pitts, a white suffragist and abolitionist from Honeyoy, New York. Pitts was the daughter of Gideon Pitts Jr., an abolitionist colleague and friend of Douglas. A graduate of Mount Holyoke College, then called Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, Pitts worked on a radical feminist publication named Alpha while living in Washington, D.C. She later worked as Douglas's secretary. Their marriage provoked a storm of controversy. Since Pitts was both white and nearly 20 years younger than Douglas, her family stopped speaking to her, his children considered the marriage a repudiation of their mother. But feminist Elizabeth Cady Stanton congratulated the couple. Douglas responded to the criticisms by saying that his first marriage had been to someone the color of his mother, and his second to someone the color of his father. The Freedman Savings Bank went bankrupt on June 29, 1874 just a few months after Douglas became its president in late March. During that same economic crisis, his final newspaper, The New National Era, failed in September. When Republican Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president, Douglas accepted an appointment as United States Marshal for the District of Columbia, which helped assure his family's financial security. In 1877, Douglas visited Thomas Ald, who was by then on his deathbed, and the two men reconciled. Douglas had met Ald's daughter, Amanda Alt Sears, some years prior, she had requested the meeting and had subsequently attended and shared one of Douglas' speeches. Her father complimented her for reaching out to Douglas. The visit also appears to have brought closure to Douglas, although some criticized his effort. That same year, Douglas bought the house that was to be the family's final home in Washington, D.C., on a hill above the Anacostia River. He and Anna named it Cedar Hill, also spelled Cedar Hill. They expanded the house from 14 to 21 rooms, and included a china closet. One year later, Douglas purchased adjoining lots and expanded the property to 15 acres, 61,000 square meters. The home is now preserved as the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. In 1881, Douglas published the final edition of his autobiography, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. That year he was appointed as recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia.
His wife Anna Marie Douglas died in 1882, leaving the widower devastated. After a period of mourning, Douglas found new meaning from working with activist Ida B. Wells. He remarried in 1884, as mentioned above. Douglas also continued his speaking engagements and travel, both in the United States and abroad. With his new wife, Helen, Douglas traveled to England, Ireland, France, Italy, Egypt and Greece from 1886 to 1887. Douglas also became known for advocating Irish home rule and supported Charles Stuart Parnell in Ireland. At the 1888 Republican National Convention, Douglas became the first African American to receive a vote for President of the United States in a major party's roll call vote. That year, Douglas spoke at Claflin College, a historically black college in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and the oldest such institution in the state. Many African Americans, called Exodisters, escaped the Klan and racially discriminatory laws in the South by moving to Kansas, where some formed all black towns to have a greater level of freedom and autonomy. Douglas did not favor this, nor the Back to Africa movement. He thought the latter resembled the American Colonization Society, which he had opposed in his youth. In 1892, at an Indianapolis conference convened by Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, Douglas spoke out against the separatist movements, urging blacks to stick it out. He made similar speeches as early as 1879, and was criticized both by fellow leaders and some audiences, who even booed him for this position. Speaking in Baltimore in 1894, Douglas said, I hope and trust all will come out right in the end, but the immediate future looks dark and troubled. I cannot shut my eyes to the ugly facts before me. President Harrison appointed Douglas as the United States' Minister Resident and Consul General to the Republic of Haiti and charged affairs for Santo Domingo in 1889, but Douglas resigned the commission in July 1891. In 1893, Haiti made Douglas a co-commissioner of its pavilion at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. In 1892, Douglas constructed rental housing for blacks, now known as Douglas Place, in the Fells Point area of Baltimore. The complex still exists, and in 2003 was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. On February 20, 1895, Douglas attended a meeting of the National Council of Women in Washington, D.C. During that meeting, he was brought to the platform and received a standing ovation. Shortly after he returned home, Douglas died of a massive heart attack. He was 77. His funeral was held at the Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. Thousands of people passed by his coffin to show their respect. Although Douglas had attended several churches in the nation's capital, he had a pew here and donated two standing candelabras when this church had moved to a new building in 1886. He also gave many lectures there, including his last major speech, The Lesson of the Hour. Douglas Coffin was transported back to Rochester, New York where he had lived for 25 years, longer than anywhere else in his life. He was buried next to Anna in the Douglas family plot of Mount Hope Cemetery, and Helen joined them in 1903. Roy Finkenbein argues, the most influential African American of the 19th century, Douglas made a career of agitating the American conscience. He spoke and wrote on behalf of a variety of reform causes, women's rights, temperance, peace, land reform, free public education and the abolition of capital punishment. But he devoted the bulk of his time, immense talent, and boundless energy to ending slavery and gaining equal rights for African Americans. These were the central concerns of his long reform career. Douglas understood that the struggle for emancipation and equality demanded forceful, persistent, and unyielding agitation. And he recognized that African Americans must play a conspicuous role in that struggle. Less than a month before his death, when a young black man solicited his advice to an African American just starting out in the world, Douglas replied without hesitation, Agitate! 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 The Episcopal Church, USA, remembers Douglas annually on its liturgical calendar for February 20, the anniversary of his death. Many public schools have also been named in his honor. Douglas still has living descendants today, such as Ken Morris, who is also a descendant of Bookert, Washington. Other honors and remembrances, organized chronologically, include Scholarship, for young readers Documentary films Douglas Sources Online Resource guides Biographical information Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.